All right, so we have about 220 videos to go. We've done about 30 videos. If you have not checked out the GitHub, check out the GitHub. I have not been that good with code samples. My first videos don't have code samples, but I think it's very necessary for learning to have clear code samples, well-named, well-commented for teaching purposes. In my opinion, I don't really like comments in code because when code changes, the comments won't change. But anyway, also I will be gone for about um, four or five days. I'm going to be in Germany visiting a friend and I hope to make a video there. As always, if you have not already subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to make this the premier resource, the one of the best resources for preparing for software engineering interviews. Obviously I can't build like a brand or thing like Leak Code or like Geeks for Geeks because they're huge websites. They control the infrastructure that dominates this space of prep and and all the information that we learn from. But I want to make a, a vast resource with tons of helpful videos with clear explanations to make this process a little less hellish. So let's get into our problem, climbing stairs, and I'll see you later. Okay, so today's question is climbing stairs. This is a fundamental dynamic programming problem, all about subproblemy, always all about subproblemy. And what the question asks is if I'm given a certain amount of steps to traverse, if I need to jump three steps, I if I only can take a one step and a two step, how many ways or how many unique ways are there to climb the stairs? So if I have to traverse two steps, what I can do is I can take a one step and a one step. That adds up to two steps. Or I can just take my two step. I can just do the two step and then I've gone two steps. If I have to traverse three steps upwards, I can go a one step, a one step, a one step. That is three steps. I also can do a two step and then a one step, or I can take the one step first and then do the two step. That's how I do three steps. If I need to do four steps, the number of unique ways is five. What do those look like? I take a one step, a one step, a one step, and a one step. I could take a two step and then a one step, a one step. I could take a one step, the two step, and then the one step. And then I could take one, one, and then use two as the final step. Finally, I could just do the two step and the two step. And that adds up to four steps. So how are we going to approach this problem? As always, Tushar, take it away. We will have to use dynamic programming to solve this. What you need to understand about this problem is, I, I, if you've done this problem, it's simple. But if you've never seen this problem before, what, what do we need to ask ourselves? How do we need to think about this? We know this is dynamic programming because, yeah, the title of the video said that and the thumbnail said that. But how would you approach this in an interview? So first, I would ask you, what does it mean to take a certain amount of steps from a certain point. What does that mean? What does that do to our overarching problem? And how can we relate those reductions to subproblems to a global answer? So, okay, stay with me. What I want to do is look at the top-down approach and then we'll see why we need to use dynamic programming. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the top-down approach. No memoization at all. We're going to see why we need the memoization, but I need to take six steps. All that we need to understand is what is my choice? What is my choice in reduction of subproblems? So at every step, if I take a one step or a two step, no matter what I do, if I'm at a certain position, what can I do? I can take a one step or a two step. Here's what happens if I have six steps to take and I can take a two step and a one step, the answer, the answer to the subproblem is going to be the sum of the possibility trees, what those yield, if I take a two step or a one step. If I take a two step, we branch. What does that look like? If I take a two step, that means I have four steps left to take. If I take a one step, that means I have five steps left to take. Let me label these. So the answer to six steps, the total ways to make six steps is the sum of the answer between the total ways to make four steps and the total ways to make five steps. So this is the intuition. What we're gonna do is at every point we're going to express the two possibilities we have and what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep reducing, reducing, reducing. When we get here, we're gonna have base cases. Our base cases is we know the answer. When I have zero steps to take, how many ways are there to step? There's 
there's one way, we can do nothing. If I'm negative, how many ways are there to make those steps? There's zero ways. Those are our base cases, f of zero and f of a negative number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep reducing, we're gonna keep expressing our decisions and go down in this tree till we reach our base cases. And then what we're gonna see is our base cases know the answer. They're going to return us up, they're gonna give us knowledge, and on the way back upwards, we'll start having answers. And I want you to follow me, just, just stay with me for this. So at the four subproblem, I have two choices. Do a two step or a one step. Let's exercise both choices. So if we take the two step at the subproblem four, we're going to know that the answer to the subproblem four is the addition of if we took a two step, if we took a one step. Remember, four minus two, four minus one. So what we do is we add those. And now we can express our decisions for the five step. So remember, our code is going to go depth first. We're going to solve all these subproblems down here before we get here. We'll see how that plays into memoization. So right here, five, let's take our two step and one step. So the answer to the amount of ways we can make a five step is the sum of the ways we make three step and the ways we make a four step. So do you see how eventually we're going to converge to a solution? The sums will do themselves as we're coming back up and then we'll have the answer for our overall call. So what we need to do here is we need to break down the two step. So the answer to the two step is the sum between if we take zero steps and if we take one step. So the thing is, we see a base case here. For zero, we already know the answer to this. So the thing is, this zero is just going to return, is going to return to our caller the amount one, because the amount of ways we can make zero steps is one, if we can take one or two steps. We return one. So after we return one, okay, that's great. So now let's break down the three. And now let's break down both of these guys. And notice, three minus two, three minus one. 4 minus 2, 4 minus 1. So that's what we're doing, 3 minus 2, 3 minus 1. 2 minus 2, 2 minus 1. We're just expressing our decisions at each point and that's going to build up to our global answer. So what we need to do here is let's break down these levels further. Again, we're going breadth first. This is not how the code would do it. It would go down this tree first. We can either take the one step first or the two step first. It doesn't matter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break all of these down further. All right, and so now we see that we've broken down at a level further. We've taken our two step, we've taken our one step. So now we see we have a ton of base cases that panned out here, a ton of base cases turned out to happen. So if we go negative, we know that the amount of ways is zero. So what we do is we return zero upwards. And let me get rid of those plus signs just for readability because we get the point now that it's in addition. So what we need to do is return zero. This returns zero because that's the space case. So this zero returns one because the amount of ways we can make zero steps is one way. We do nothing. And now let's fill out all of our other base cases and what they return. And I want you to notice a lot of these base cases have panned out. When we go negative, we return zero. When we get zero, we return one, as you can see. But we still have more subproblems to solve. So let's go through our final tier. And again, we'll see why this is very bad and inefficient until we memoize it. So let's continue and finish off these subproblems like these ones and these twos. Okay, and so what we want to do is we panned out all of our base cases, so let's do what all these base cases will yield. If we go negative, we return zero. There's no ways we can make negative steps. If we need to make zero steps, then the amount of ways to make zero steps is one. We just do nothing. So now let's pan out all of these base cases and do you see? This recursion returns upwards. We keep going. What's the answer? We ask another call. We ask it. Can you give me an answer? Can you give me an answer? Can you give me an answer? Until we have an answer. When we have an answer, they go backwards. They're like, hey, I have this answer. And then the guy who just got his answer, he's like, oh wait, yeah, let me calculate my answer. He tells it to the guy above him. So this is gonna go upwards. And eventually we'll get to our top solution here. So what we need to do is let's show all of our base cases returning. So now what we do is let's do our addition upwards. So the subproblem answer for one is zero plus one. So the answer is one, one returns one. So everywhere that we see a one answering, we can return a one because we know the answer to the subproblem is one. The code would actually do it. Let's just do it for speed's sake. And so now we see the answer to the two subproblem is one plus one. The answer to the two subproblem is two. So now let's go through the whole other tree and fill that out. And do you see how all of these returns are slowly building us upwards? So now, the answer to the three subproblem, we're gonna need that for the four subproblem. The answer to the three subproblem is two plus one, which is three. 
So the answer to the three sub problem is three. Let's return that upwards. All right, and so now let's finish off the other threes and get them to return three. And this is a critical realization I want you to make. Do you see how the four sub problem has its answer? Do you see how this four sub problem is over here? And do you see how this three sub problem, three sub problem? We're gonna look at that shortly, but let's finish this. So two plus three is five. So the answer to the four sub problem is five. So let's fill out this four sub problem. So now we have the answer for if we took a one step. So what we need to do is we need to finish off this five. The answer to the five sub problem is three plus five, which is eight. And I have not even checked this, but the answer to the six sub problem is going to be 13. Let me double check. And excellent. So the answer to the six sub problem is 13. I just ran the test case on it. So what we notice is first off, I want to establish, yes, this is like the Fibonacci sequence because we're doing a one step, two step. We're looking one behind us and two behind us. But aside from that, what we notice is that we are duplicating sub problems. I want you to notice. In a depth first manner, we're going to go down here and solve all these subproblems. I will have the answer for the zero subproblem. I'll have the answer for one. I'll have the answer for two. I'll have the answer for three. I'll have the answer for four. Why am I answering two over here? Why am I answering four? Why am I answering one? Why am I repeating subproblems in this tree? So the problem is this code runs in exponential time. It runs in this code runs in two to the n time. Why is that? Unmemoized, what we're going to do is that each of these nodes, we're going to definitely make two forkings. We're going to fork twice. So the depth of the recursion tree at maximum, do you see? Subtract one, subtract one, 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 one. The depth of the recursion tree is going to be six. It's going to be, if we subtracted a one each time, we're going to have a depth of six on this tree. So the bound, upper bound on time is going to be two to the n. Is this an exact bound? No, it is not an exact bound. But we can upper bound the time by using that knowledge. We know that it's going to be upper bounded by two to the n. And the problem is we're repeating subproblems. So this is where memoization kicks in. So the problem is, I want you to notice, guess what? When I go depth first, I'll have the answer to the four subproblem. What happens is this whole subtree, do you see all this work that we're going to cut out for the four subproblem? Let's cut it out right now. Did you just see that? Do you see how huge of a chunk that ate up of our tree? By not following the four path, because I already know the answer, the answer is five to the four subproblem. I literally saved myself all that work because I know the answer. But there's another thing. We know the answer to the three subproblem. It's one plus two, it's three. So why am I doing that? Why am I doing that again? I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to cut this whole subtree out. So let's cut it out right now. So do you see here, do you see? We just removed, it's, it's amazing how much work you can save by knowing the subproblems you already answered. And again here, we're gonna go in a depth first manner. We'll already have the answer for the one subproblem. We won't need to solve it here. So let's cut that out right now. When we're here, we're also going to have the answer for a two subproblem. We won't need to know the answer for the two subproblem down here. Let's cut that out right now. So this three subproblem is going to have the answer for the one subproblem. It's going to have the answer for the two subproblem that it needs. So the thing is, this is roughly how our recursion tree will look like. I'm, I'm not totally sure if this is completely right, but I want you to understand what we just did. That was memoization. I can erase this because now we're using memoization. Do you see how many calls we just destroyed? Do you see how much of time we just saved? That is what memoization is about. I'm a huge fan of top-down approach for dynamic programming. I love how intuitive it is. And as long as you memoize it, it's, it's a good way to go about these problems. So now let's look at the bottom-up approach. And the reason it's bottom-up is we start from the bottom and then we work upwards towards the answer. So we're going to see how that table pans out right now. So now let's look at the bottom up approach. So the, each of these cells, each of these cells, whenever we're doing dynamic programming tables, every one of the cells, all they mean is if I'm taking zero steps, how many unique ways can I take steps if I can take a one or two step? If I need to make three steps, how many unique ways are there to make three steps with one and two steps? And our original question, if I need to make six steps, how many unique ways are there to make six steps with a one and a two step? In Java, a table is initialized to zero. All of the values have zero in here, so we can just give it that. So we're going to be solving through until we get our subproblem six. So what we need to do is the answer to the subproblem six is like we just did. 
the answer to the subproblem of 5 if we take a 1 step, and the answer to the subproblem of 4 if we take the 2 step. The sum of those is going to be the answer to subproblem 6. Same thing we did, we're just going bottom up this time. What we're doing here is the same thing as our top down approach. We're just going to start from the bottom with what we know, our base cases. The amount of unique ways that we can take a one or two step and make zero steps is one, we do nothing. And the amount of unique ways to make one step with a one and two step is just taking the one step, so what? So this is all we need. We need two base cases in order to solve this table because this table is going to rely on two previous values. So this cell, if we take a one step, we get one. If we take a two step, we get one. So one plus one is the answer to the subproblem two, which is, which is now two. So all we did is take the addition between if we took a one step and we took a two step, addition of these subproblems. So again, the answer to the subproblem with three is the addition of if we take a two step, three minus two is one. If we take the one step, three minus one is two. So now, addition, two plus one, three. And yes, we could do this in constant space, but I just want to do it like this so that you can see how we fill this out and how the subproblems pan out. Do you notice how every time all we care about is the two previous items? This means we can just use constant variables. We can just use local variables to keep this because it makes it more clear for teaching purposes. So now the answer to the four is going to be the addition of the third and the second subproblem. Why? If we take a one step, four minus one is three. Take the two step, four minus two is two. Addition. So now two plus three is five. And so now the answer to our five subproblem, three plus five is eight. And now the six subproblem is the addition. Take a one step, take a two step. Take a one step, take a two step. The addition is going to be eight plus five, 13. And so that's it, that is the bottom up approach. So all we do is we add the previous cells because the answer to this subproblem is the addition of these two subproblems. And our base cases allowed us to answer these. We ripple down the array and we finish and we get our answer, which is 13. So this is how this problem is done. The reason this is easy dynamic programming is because the subproblems are fairly easy to break down. It's kind of difficult to understand this at first, but once you really see how this, how this works, it becomes very straightforward. So now let's look at the time and space complexities of both solutions. So the time and space of both the top down and bottom up approach are going to be O of n. The n is the total stairs to climb. If I need to climb six stairs, that means these are going to be my bounds. So the reason that our top down approach, the recursive approach is O of n space is because of our call stack. We're going to have to use O of n space and also we're going to have to store n subproblems. The reason that our bottom up approach is O of n space is because we keep that table with n plus one subproblems. If you count the zero subproblem, call it n. Doesn't matter, we scale linearly in space. We could do this in constant space. We could do it in constant space because all we care about is the previous two items. So for the bottom up approach, we can do it in constant space. But for the top down, our upper bound is going to have to be O of n on the space because of a recursion. Even if we get rid of that table, we're still gonna have the recursion if we somehow were able to keep track of the two um, previous items. For the time complexity, the reason it's O of n is because for memoization, we're only going to solve up to n subproblems. After that, we will have constant time knowledge of the answer to a subproblem. So we would never go past that. Our bound is going to be the bound on the amount of subproblems we have to solve. And for the bottom up, pretty straightforward. We just go through an array with n plus one entries, and that's why it's O of n time for the bottom up. So this is this question. If this was a clear explanation, if this helped you understand things better, then subscribe to the channel, like this video. My goal is to make this a premier resource for software engineering interviews and people learning this stuff. I understand that this is not exactly the most practical stuff in industry, so we really need a great resource to study this off time when we need to interview because it doesn't always correlate to what we're doing during the day. So that's all for me. And I hope that...